so many things yesterday that were profound, but I really liked at the end that the idea, I like that Italian word for sketch being idea. NTA. NTA. Yes, yes, that was, because that's what you're going to see happen in the next 24 minutes. It's all about ideas in the vehicle of a drawing to capture those ideas. I'd like to just read the little sort of, I guess, I don't think it's really a manifesto, but just like to just quietly read this from head to heart to hand, drawing in the digital age. For me, the best architecture of an age celebrates the balance, a balance of pragmatism and poetry, a balance. It connects history, context, and program while striving to enhance the sense of community, provide intellectual richness, and delight the senses. The best design solutions depend not merely upon form, space, or image, but upon the more holistic consideration of an inside, out, outside, in design process. The ability of a simple scale drawing, and again, scale is an important issue, so these are my tools. I have a pencil, and I have a scale. Okay, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the next uh, little bit. But the ability of a simple scale drawing to inform, define, and test inventions of the mind with the realities of program and place is unparalleled. A drawing can efficiently and elegantly map the macro boundaries of the site's conditions as related to the path of the sun <laughs> and the energized flow of surrounding movements. It can capture nuances of topography, axes of connectivity, as well as unexpectedly framed vistas and intimately scaled atmospheres of an architectural experience. From the raw energy of the rough sketch, to the refinement of the formal schematic, through to the carefully detailed construction documents used to guide the maker craftsman, drawings are always at the heart, both the heart and soul, of the architect's expression of ideas. So this process, again, in the digital age, you're going to see an interesting, probably, collision of experiences and attitudes. Uh, I went for a walk this morning among old friends, and I realized that I was last here 50 years ago, in 1966, at the invitation of Erwin Miller's aunt, who I met in another story that we can talk about tonight. But anyways, this whole process, and the hard part is really about the soul of ideas. So it's not just the intellectual, but it's the sensual. The So it's four case studies. What you're seeing is that architect, first, architecture comes from listening. And listening is not just the, the verbal conversation with your clients and their needs and their program, but it's listening to the place, the nuance, all the potentials of what it can be about. So listening comes before the first line. My first process is often to lay down the site after I know something's real, and I might lay on my board under all the other activity of the day for a long time, and I'm trying to figure out where will be the front door, where will be the entry to this experience, how do you arrive at the site? And that has nothing to do with north-south or whatever, it's just finding that energy because being a man of my hand, I'm designing for my body, so I want to get in that motion, I, I can't design upside down. I mean, if north's up there and you come this way, that's irrelevant. I'm finding where the path of energy is all about. This sketch, after programming with this client, this client that you see here, obviously you recognize somebody that's a client that came from outside of Philadelphia. They last lived in a 1700s colonial house. He was a wood carpenter framer guy, and they were a friend of the family, and uh, by uh, my parents and their parents in Sun City. So I was suspect that I tried to chase him away immediately because I thought this was just a weird convenience. I gave him the name of three other architects, Somehow, they were guys that I thought would be good for them. They kept saying, no, you're, you're a will client. I can tell. Go back to him and tell him you got to do the house, right? So anyway, we arrived at the site, and there was a certain energy that was about this grade that you see here. And so this is a sketch, a very formative sketch. And there's probably a few background doodles, but I, I felt there was a seam of geology here that I wanted to open up. And there was something in the rigor of this diagonal to the southwest. And so those, that was those lines and those energies, that is the scale. So anybody that wants to take this scale and scale this drawing to know how big it is, you can take it to the screen and we can figure that out real quick, okay? But it's, it's got this energy, and I'm just, maybe that's my Lutheran, you know, Midwestern background, but I, I, I like that rigor. We're playing with some interesting geometries here. 
the energy of erupting the earth. The block is made of an aggregate that matches perfectly the site. Second sketch, second day. So we did two days in process here. You step back a little bit. I'm thinking there's other things happening. There's more drawings obviously related. And it wasn't until it was framed and I drove to the overlook here. Again, the serendipity of that ridge line beyond the house. A little bit of rigor as an artist or an architect, you're given all kinds of gifts of the context, right? So you can see what those angles are doing for us. And you go from those rough sketches with some fluidity, and these are what I used to do with regularity. They're a little more, less formal now, but this was ink. These were pinographs. These were line weights. This was occupying and living in the spaces. And I think what drawing gives us the ability to do is live in our architecture much quicker than people that work with a screen. I find one of my biggest sort of angst or anxieties in seeing student work, which I see often now, is they aren't occupying the environment. I'm of a culture and a time that works in plan and section. And it takes me to all kinds of other opportunities of space and form. Too many people today are working in form and parametrics only, and they're not really inhabiting those spaces. So here you can see the house growing. Here's the sectional aspect of it. And these are construction drawings. And you can see we're struggling with the hybrid. I, I guess the computer is printing up my title blocks at that time. I'm doing this weird sticky back stuff for the next step after Electroset. It's hand drawings. And if you can see that there's, there's something evolving. There's lots of nuance. There's lots of change. Sections begat that. And then details. Because without details, I mean, it's, it's, it's again like the artist here. It's the detail of what you can do when you're in the catacombs. It's what you're doing. And I want to know, Anthony, is that music score that's in your video? Were you listening to that while you were doing that? Do you listen to music when you do your thing? Usually not, actually. Yeah, well, it's perfectly scored. And it's, I watched it again to warm up for today. It's Cold good. Train, man. Yeah, right, there you go. So again, the working drawings. Elevations, numbering, rigor, logic, understanding of craftsmen. Because along with, quote, the sketch idea, is the ability to keep listening and take it to the field and not just be talking to your clients and the neighbors and everything else, but talking to the craftsmen. It's amazing how much they still have to give us. So, three more case studies. Reno, Nevada, a museum. This was a project that's been ongoing since 1999. It came as a short, informal competition of, 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 of the, between them. Two, two firms, I have a good luck of that. It's nice when they call you up on the phone, they say you're on a short list, they didn't even know there was a short list, so that was good. So Reno's an interesting place. It's all about the glitter and the glitz, it's sort of the B team to Las Vegas, and that's good. But on the south side of the Truckee River, they have a very, very fine institution. It's called the Nevada Museum of Art. So, program drives, and I still play with the Ouija board of the program to scale. It's in my sort of thing. There are loose pieces of paper, and now they're printed up digitally. I'm working in that new world we got, right? But they're all cut apart and loose because, again, you can clear the relationships quickly and start over again. It's like playing dominoes. And so all these squares are building relationships. I know where circulation is, what everything's tying in, and it's just, you know, it's a crutch at one level, and yet we never have enough time, and we never get enough money to do what we really want to do and so we have to learn certain efficiencies. And I have the, the benefit of I was in a five-person studio in Milwaukee. I was on my way to formal education at IOT, got waylaid in the summer job, and never looked back. So my BFA is in sculpture, and I've got structures and urban planning and architecture. So it, it worked out fine. But at the same time, I'm thinking about that. I'm looking at a very tight urban site. I'm not only dimensioned what the parking requirement would be, and that sort of stole the site immediately, but I'm immediately inventing the new energy I hadn't played with before of what the building might become. So these are all happening at the same moment in this search for, for the idea. Oops. Now these are high-tech models, okay? <laughs> these are truly high-tech 1999 models, okay? Now let me explain high-tech, okay? So we build a context model because context is everything. And so often on that screen that happens everywhere, we never in that screen operate always with the context alive. So built context, there's a Porsche building there, a bad developer building on the left, which is our eastern flank. We've got the little houses on the right. We've got our site. And so we built this quick study model. And I have the belief that if you're ready to go to the laser cutter in a contemporary world of architectural design, creativity is stopped. Because you are so far beyond the accident of a possibility, you can't even see straight. 
And then you put it together and you have all those terrible burn marks on it. And it's so quick that they line up for those, for those to get in the queue, right? Because then they can move on, right? So we got this model going. So that's pretty low tech yet, but high tech. I took a photograph, okay? <laughs> the camera had film in it, okay? <laughs> so high tech happens because we have the luxury. My studio at that time is 20 minutes from the, 15 miles out in the desert away from the closest one hour photo place. So I send staff out with those photos. We're two days away from a presentation, right? Clients come. So they wait, they have lunch while they're waiting for the one hour photos to arrive, right? Come back to the studio, so we take the little five by seven, or three by five, whatever, you get the cheap photos, right? And we don't have a colored copier. We don't have a scanner. That's all, this is 1999, folks. The world has changed since then. So we scanned them and blew them up on the Xerox machine. Black only, right? Then you get your high-tech drafting materials, your yellow highlighters, your white-out markers, a couple of pens. You add some landscape right away into the game, and suddenly you're realizing that this was pretty dumb when it went there, because you can imagine this wasn't doing this wonderful rake. It didn't have this, this window, and the back was really starting to be fun, right? And that's why I presented to the client the next day. You know, you're presenting ideas. And it's so funny, because in this world of the digital, what often happens is you present these things, and the client assumes you're done with design. When can we start building? And the next build comes and you're still in DD or late SDs, but, but it, you did it, you designed it, what's the deal? You know, because it, those, there's, there's such authenticity in those sort of video game red reads that we said. So we're moving down the, the, the field here and we're starting to evolve this thing. And it's this whole idea with blackness being a parad sort of the paradox to the glitzer and the, of the strip, Virginia, with all the casinos. And I'm starting to develop facades off of those rough sketches and massings out there. Suddenly I'm sculpting that warping facade here, the black skin with the ventilation. And there is what it all resulted in. You know, there's a few other drawings in between, a few steps happening there. And I'm, I'm gonna be very honest so we get on the good ground even early in this conversation. I present the a more formal model, some more formal drawings to the board of the museum. And suddenly after the presentation, this guy comes up and he says, oh my God, I didn't know you'd been to the Black Rock Desert. Oh yeah, it's, uh, I'm influenced by all the geology, everything that's happening there, right? Well, there was a, um, the, the Altered Landscape exhibit of photography was opening that night, and there were several photographers there, this is lady, and I'm saying, I gotta figure out how to get to the Black Rock Desert, and I could fool them once, but I can't fool them tomorrow, right? So I went out to the Black Rock Desert the day after saying convincing, I've been there, yeah, I got, I got your geology, that's what inspired the whole building, right? And that photograph was taken, the tripod was set up, I went with this premier photographer from the show, and that is, I was shocked when I got out there and I saw my building coming out of that landscape. It was cool, it was good. Okay, I'm in a phone booth in Little Rock, Arkansas, lecturing at a gig for the AIA. The phone rings, we're outside of Bill Clinton's favorite barbecue joint, and a lady's on the phone, Leslie, and she's with the Library Foundation in Billings, Montana. I've been to Billings a few times, but I never preconceived because you're gonna get you know, disappointed too often. You know, Keith, really understand something before you put that first pencil line down on a piece of paper. It's, it's there because this, this, this is a potent instrument. A couple years ago, I was introducing my quad laureate friend, Alberto Rios, at an event at the Central Library in Phoenix. He held up a pencil and he said, ladies and gentlemen, you can all be me. Do you realize there are 40,000 words in this pencil, you know, it's a nice hard pencil and you can, 40,000 words, um, imagine how many buildings are in this pencil. It's pretty cool. That's really instant stuff, right? And you never have a crash, it just always keeps on giving. So anyways, Leslie's on the phone and I'm explaining I was there and she's saying, yes, we have a benefactor, he's gotta pay all the architectural fees, we're in a search, we've gotten your name, again, one of these calls of you're on a short list and oh, okay, I'm game. Okay, so what happens is that I, you know, I want to get into the place as quickly as possible. I said, Leslie, you know, I've been to your town, I know it a little bit, but I'm not prepared to really, but I've got a question. What building, what aspect of Billings, Montana, largest city in Montana, hundreds of thousand people in the eastern part of the state, what do people really relish in your town? And she said, well, the rim rocks, the rim rocks. There's this, this geologic edge around the town. You're seated up on the top here. This is the side of my building. It's 
a rotated grid parallel with the railroad tracks, which in a way is parallel to the Yellowstone River. We have the Jefferson grid over here. We have the rotation of the town when the, all the homesteaders came next to the railroad tracks. And we have the, the 50s all over here with all the lazy, stupid cul-de-sacs and all this sort of nonsense up, up there. So we got this thing happening, but this rim rock here, the airport, this is the rim, and there's the rim rock. And she told me, this is what our place is about. It's where the prairie meets the foothills, the mountains, the Rockies. So great downtown street, not unlike what we've got a week from here, and they've restored it you know, in that spirit. Great, ambitious thing. And pole barns, ladies and gentlemen, pole barns. They're great in context. So you got this list. You don't know much about it. They're obviously sort of inexperienced at doing what they're doing, but you can taste it. You can really feel it. There was good energy. So my wife and I flew up. Legion Airline, it was a cheap deal out of Mesa, Arizona, but you, it's one of the things where they move hunters or people that are cold down to the desert, and it's a, it's a Thursday flight and a Sunday return. So we knew we were gonna have four days and it wasn't as all good, but I get to meet the client. I get to see if it's there, it's on my nickel, okay? And we're going there and I spend a day and during that day I meet with the potential client, the board, a bunch of stuff, checking out the, the whole thing, listening, doing that background research. And this is the first concept drawing on the 19th of November. It's snowing outside. Our whole plan ended up being four days in, in, in buildings, which was ideal. But anyways, that's the first sketch for this building up there. That's the site, that's the grid. I'm sitting across from the planning lady, along with the library director, and she wanted a door off sixth. So you're starting to feel something happen. I was given a program that morning. Hey, I'm, I'm a hog heaven. I mean, this is great stuff. I can start thinking. I'm taking it apart where things are. We are now on Sunday morning. I have a meeting with Leslie, the head of the foundation board. At that point, we're hearing about our elderly donor. We're thinking he wants to make this decision quick. He might be gone tomorrow. And I didn't know, it's, it's not a competition at that point. And so I'm, I'm getting ready. So I get up and I already had for my studio a site plan to scale set up. Gotta be scale. I knew what the program was and Louise is sleeping and I'm at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the hotel room. And I'm making this diagram. The world is always different, okay? So anyway, you see certain things happening. You see some sections happening, all this stuff. I did this nice little set of drawings. Did this little rendering. I have here first thought, visionary concept sketch, library for glowing pavilion above, you know, all this good stuff, floating knowledge, all that sort of, and a building. And a couple weeks, we were told at the end of that, oh, we're gonna have a little competition. Well, it was competition of two again. I don't know why this happens. We didn't know who the first one was. We flipped a coin because presentation, we got, we got First one the cost, just like tennis. We said, we'll play last. We did the presentation. We came with drawings and models and the evolution very quickly from these sort of ideas. Now, this rendering is interesting because this is today. I have these Uber render guys that I work with. And so I've taken this photograph. This isn't uh, photoshopped in snow. This was the condition that Louise and I saw that Sunday as we were trying to get out of town, which we barely did because of the storm. I'm so focused with my render on changing the red stop and go light screen that I missed the key element in the diagram. So I'm in the interview two weeks later after this is happening, week before Christmas, on for a nice interview with the first lady up, at the, the people are represented, the client's not in the thing because he's a very recognizable character, but you go to interview and your main client, you got your de desktop here, and it's taped on right here, you see a little camera taped on this bad Dell computer, and that's Mr. Smith. He's right there. Hi, Mr. Smith. He's down in Florida already. Hi. Mm -hmm. Leslie's over there where Kelly is. She's on the phone with Mr. Smith. So I sort of got to discreetly keep my eye on Kelly over here. Because if he's happy, I'm probably going to be happy. And I'm selling to four or five people in the room, right? So we got through the presentation. We talked sustainability. We talked all this nine yards. We got the model. We got the whole bit, right? And all of a sudden, this rendering comes up. And you're going around with the Q&A and this very smart business banker type, that's the last question up on the group with it's funny to ask questions, says, Mr. Bruder, you talk about you know this place sort of and all this good stuff, but you know that, that car there, that white one, it's going the wrong way on six. That's a one-way street. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you say? You're playing for the roses. This is the Super Bowl. This is a bad sports metaphor. You're, you're in Carnegie Hall. Oh my God, sir, it worked. He looks at me. What do you mean it worked? I said, when you start this conversation, when I met with you three weeks ago, Mr. Smith, I know once a landmark. 
That's a Alfa Romeo rented in Los Angeles by two Swiss architects. They are coming across America looking at all the great landmarks of architecture in America, so we won. Nine people laugh. You're home. A week later, I got a call, and then there's our building. Okay, and the traffic's all going the right way. No Swiss architects yet. Uh, I'm happy to announce that again, you look at context, this is the dude rancher here. This is where we spent most of our nights when we were in town. Nobody believed it, but it's this old 50s little motel. But I love weeping mortar, and we're talking to it here. We're talking about the whole nine yards. Context is everywhere. This is what those little sketches and ideas and searches turn into. And I'm happy to report that on Tuesday I'll be official, so don't tell anybody this weekend, but this is one of seven honor award libraries announced to be announced for 2016 on Tuesday by the ALA AIA. So, one last project to talk about. This is how it happens. This is the Dow Retreat. He's a metal worker. We met each other about a year ago. We would always knew we were destined to work together, Barbara and Scott Dow. This is Yarnell, a little hill town outside of Phoenix, up near Prescott. And this is, you're going to see the process. You're going to see the 25 drawings that happened on three, three mornings about two months ago, a month and a half ago. I'm looking at this aerial. Google's a great thing. So we got the area going, we got the grid here, we see the grid of Jefferson twisted. This is the road that'll connect you all the way to Canada if you want, and all the way down to South America. And there's a grid here. You go on this side of the Arnell, and everything's cattywampus, you know, because of topography and all kinds of things. This is our site, but it happens when you study it, it's exactly parallel to the grid. That's a good thing. So we're up here. Here's the site of the house. Here's the trailer and what's been there for the last 20 years. And again, this is a metal worker, but he treats himself on weekends, and it's going to be a weekend retreat. That's called a Tesla. That's a Type 2 Tesla. It's very nice. Drives itself. I got on the roof, and Louise and Barb and Scott and I are on the site, and we can't figure out where north is or west to save our soul. We're in. It's just, um, we don't know where the sun's going to rise today or winter or whatever else. That's looking the other way. We're on the roof, and we're talking about this little house. So we got the program, it's pretty basic. We got a guest bedroom, a bedroom, a bath, a bath and a half, living dining, it's 1,300 square feet, you got the game. Got the owner built, master craftsman. So I'm finding now, I'm talking about how we could get to the site. This is a site, I'm arriving in the garage, I'm playing with the, we got a garage, it's gonna be big enough so we don't scratch the Tesla when we're working in the shop. That's the building envelope in blue, we checked with the building department. There's a couple trees on the site, a couple things there, there's the old trailer originally and the stuff added on. And this is how it starts happening. And this is the, probably the most important thing I've done, is it's suddenly I realize within the building envelope that we're allowed, I can put a crosshairs of a compass on it, and I not only design the house, but I give it a name. This is Compass House. And as you go in the house, no matter where you are, and those reviews were taken from standing on this old roof, we know where east is. We know where north is. We know where the hot sun in summer is and isn't. And so it's Compass House, and it starts setting up an energy. And then the sketches are happening, and I'm trying the garage on that way, which actually ends up being what happened. We were on the site last week, and so we made that little rotation, but everything's working. But you're playing back and forth there. You know, these, you can see that I'm dating things. It's a sort of sound line. You don't want to lose track of where you were. This is the whole thing happening. Now, this is interesting because, again, this thing of scale, you know, these, you know, the two worst things that's ever happened to architecture in the late 20th century were the fountainhead and cocktail napkin sketches. Okay? They're both bullshit, okay? Okay? And so here I'm scaled in fairly quickly. It's not inhibiting my creativity, I don't think. And this is a piece out of a post it, so that's technology creeping in, 3M post it. They have the sticky back edges on. And that's the scale, the overhang of this rotated house. So here's north, got it, south. East, west, you come up the stair, you get this killer view off to the north, you make a twist into this big living dining room thing here, you got master bedroom, you got deck, it's all working nice. And that piece of thing, I was trying to figure out how the roof would work, how you would frame this, how would everything would be. So suddenly I lifted up that little square three and post it, and I've got my roof designed. It's very cool. We're getting more serious here. We're getting ready for that next level of jump, but the next level of jump you'll be pleased with and surprised with, I, I hope. So this is a uh, landscape. These are views, you know, constantly forgetting. Suddenly this little tilt we did, 
we can do rainwater management and take the whole drainage of that roof with no gutters, one gutter on one edge, and fill that water cistern and have water, which is a big problem in the desert. This is the paving plans for the gallery in the left first space. We might as well verify that I'm really on course here. We have to buy one column that goes to the ground. We've got a poured concrete garage, which is the virtue of some guy in town that's got cheap uh, uh, foundation former because we all throw out of a fruit uh, carboom. Here's the framing, it's still working. Here's the roof pitch that way. And then I come in and I have Jeff in my studio, he's about 53, he pounds the keyboard, he's not a concert pianist like the young people that play the keyboard. But he's really smart, he knows all the details and all the things, but I don't like sitting next to him because he pounds. Like it doesn't matter Jeff, really, I can't tell him. He's a really smart guy, he's very large, and he pounds, right? So he spends about six hours, I think he had eight hours totally, taking my sketches up to the scale. Then I go over and pass the wall across, wall across the room to Christina, my summer intern, who was either choosing to go to MIT tomorrow or going to uh, a full ride at uh, Berkeley. So we'll see, but she's really good on SketchUp. So this is just SketchUp. We're still dropping over the context photo. You never want to forget this stuff. And it's coming together. You know, it's making. You know, there's little nuances, there's little things. He pushes here. I mean, I know what every detail is. I could sit and do <laughs> sketches on a yellow pad right now with Scott and we build the house. And then we go to the SketchUp 3D. So you didn't see a section here because it was too complicated. Where would be the right section? Probably through the stair going up, but I didn't know the truth of the rough. And this idea of twirling around in this thing 3D in a series of images, it's happening. So I love the computer on a good day. I love the technology. You know, and it's just going back and forth. But this is what it's about. This is probably the scariest and the bravest moment of my life in that sitting there is Lee Riddell, sitting right there is Ed Riddell. And we are just on the first weekend after discovering the site, meeting with the building department. I've done th two projects with this client, so I felt uninhibited with them. You know, they've seen all my ups and downs and my flaws and whatever. And I'm sitting and I'm saying, there was an empty piece of paper. And we talked through the whole program. I said, you know, I don't normally do this, you know that. But here we got the site, we got the weekend together. We're really moving along of course. I've been there a couple days. I said, I'm gonna put a line down, just humor me. Probably won't be right, but let's just try a line. I laid a line down, and suddenly there was an elevator and a stair. And suddenly things evolved, and that's the result of that in the snow a couple months ago. And uh, that's how this happens, the drawings. Now this is me really engaging the digital world. Full on, full on attitude. <laughs> Our studio is going to full rivet. Rivet is a really interesting, I'm gonna be interesting at the end of the day or tomorrow with our manifesto about where the computer's gotta go. Computers were designed to go to the moon because of the Kennedy Space Program. They weren't designed to draw for people in mind. One of my big frustrations is I can never get a person in a rendering off of one of the techno plants because they don't put people in them. You gotta drop on it to another program, Photoshop it in, do this. The biggest flaw of renderings is really that the scaled figures are normally not to scale. They have nothing to do, but you can't think about it while you're designing it. That's really important. Uh, probably in the working drawings at the beginning, you might have noticed, I should have pointed out, there were people in my working drawings. People, figures for scale, because you never can forget what you're doing. You're making pieces for people. So anyways, this is a printout from the rivet thing, and I've got some really masterful guys and gals working in the studio on that, and then we have at it with Buff. You know, because this thing of, let's take a couple notes on the thing we'll red market, we'll give it to the guy, I'll come back later. That's inefficiency. We have a round table designing the thing, and you know, design can never be lost. This is Phoenix Central Library. This is what my job number 317 looked like 20 years ago. And so that was the biggest thing I had done at that point. But that was the spade, you know? That was the day. That, was, that sketch was done on the 1st of January in 1991. And I know that because it took me $13,000 of government relations lawyers to negotiate the mayor willing to sit and tell me what was wrong with the design that he didn't like. He shared some interesting things with it, but he, you know, it was, it was weird. And it was all about what it, what it looked like. I realized that I was marching to that drummer, but we turned to this metaphorical mesa, clad in copper. But that drawing, that was the moment. That was the moment. And that was total digital and with all kinds of fancy consultants and all that stuff. This is going back to where you once were. There is the new owner now, the Bills. Uh, Martha and David Bills sitting on this perfectly maintained and elegant house. They maintain a website. If you want to look at this house in more detail, it's B-R-Y-N-E, the Byrne residence. And this is what I left two days ago. This is a tack board in my studio. 
And so I'm not kidding. So that's Skywalk House, but we're looking at the Atlantic Ocean right now. That's the site that I was telling you about, finding the front, finding the views. Uh, this is the program, even for a house. So this is under that. And that's where the energy of it is. It's about space and movement and flow and circulation. These are the renderings, right? This is interesting. This is for work on new children's re renovation of the Central Library. I've been working there for 20 years. And yet my client, now here's the interesting thing. <coughs> it is our whole tool to work with drawings, they, how we communicate. The majority of our clients do not know how to read our drawings at all. I think some of you professionals in the room realize that. And so it's really being a good storyteller as much as being a good designer and a good draftsman and a good thinker as anything else. Because right now, my very intelligent librarians have six Wonderkin renderings of the new children's area. They don't even know how to write the plan or the program. And they're doing their critique on things missing in a rendering that is totally temporal, that has nothing to do except brand it and get some marketing going to raise the money for it. And I'll close with this. I took that picture walking from my home in a repurposed office building on the, the light rail line, Central Avenue of the city. I had an idea. We were playing around with some experiments with a vertical thing. I saw an empty lot that I thought would be perfect right to, next to this thing, block off the thing. I had a meeting with a potential developer client. I took this, that photograph. This photograph is mine. That doesn't, that, that didn't exist. I walk in the studio at about 8.25, 8.30. I say, Jackie, we need something for the media at 9.30. I've got this idea. I want a rendering now. We did a couple little things. She found as you find a little bit of that green glass texture. I gave the basic shape and perspective. We set it up. She downloaded my photo from my iPhone. You know, that is my sketchbook. And uh, so that resulted, and that is called Horizon. It's 94 condos. It's over eight levels of above grade parking. And with any luck, it'll come to reality. But it allows you to dream this power of the pencil, this power of an idea. So it's all how we just choreograph all these, these things that come together. So thank you very much. That's my story about uh, drawing in the brain. And uh, thank you.